Hello, my name is Ash, and I am back. Um, this is going to be a very different thing. Um, I'm not used to doing these because I think commentary is really awkward, and I usually leave that to, for my DA2 um, perfect save one, but this is going to be more of a pre-Inquisition kind of dialogue, or monologue for me, because I'm talking at you guys, and although I really dislike that, and eventually I'm going to do a Google Hangout where a lot of us can talk about like the different like things about Dragon Age and all that, um, that's going to be planned hopefully whenever companions decide to get announced. But that's a totally different thing. Um, I'll go into that um, on detail on another day. But today I wanted to talk more about like pre-Inquisition, and whenever we're talking about the story and we're talking about... Uh, all that, Bioware didn't want to talk about it at PAX Prime. They wanted to, you know, keep it under wraps and put it in a little, like, secret spot and not talk about it. But to be honest, I want to talk about it. So, um, it's more, okay, like, uh, for instance, uh, some of the things I'm going to be talking about are the romances and particularly one topic that was raised in the LGBTQT, I believe I said that right for all the initials and yeah, um, was specifically talked about in the panel, and also I want to talk about um, the Chantry and the Mages, and also um, decisions that, you know, have purpose and significance for Inquisition, and especially since uh, the Dragon Age Keep uh, is, was announced, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, go to dragonagekeep.com and make sure to sign up for the beta so you can play in 2014. <gasps> that was really good. <laughs> um... Oh, dang it. I tried to be so cool whenever I was saying that, and now I forgot it. <clears throat> okay. But, okay, I have different topics that I want to talk about, primarily because there's going to be a lot to talk about, and Bioware is not talking about it. So I wanted to bring it up in this little pre-Inquisition, candid kind of monologue conversation with you, but you can't only talk in comments, because, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> So, I'll just start off already with uh, romances. Now, on Tumblr, specifically, uh, one of, um, someone, oh my gosh, I pro should probably not be an asshole and go back on Tumblr, going back real quick and gonna find out who actually asked it, um, la la la, oh, I have no clue where they, where it is anymore, <laughs> no, because I want to reference them, um, specifically on their ask question. But anyway, uh, oh, there we go, Ar Artistor23, and I'm sorry if I completely bludgered that whole name, but, um, as specifically about romance interests or even possible companions, um, and I specifically went into this, uh, I, I kind of used that question as, like, kind of, like, a platform for me to talk about romances and specifically on bisexuality in, it. now, it was mentioned in the LGBTQT, did I mention that already? Yes, I did. Uh, I'm having major <laughs> relapses right now. Um, but I wanted to talk about specifically on bisexuality because it's more of that romances are turning into this inclusive kind of thing. You're going to have, like, for instance, in DA2, you can romance Isabella, Anders, Fenris, and blah, blah, blah with, uh, with either a female or a male. And I'm, I was talking about whether it's too convenient or not to have bisexuality for both characters and not only that but the differences between it because i talked briefly about how hawk uh, male hawk romance with anders feels like better with well <laughs> i already just said it it male hawk feels better than the female hawk and I, I felt kind of like twisted by it because i played the female hawk with anders romance in the first one and then i played later um anders being romanced by a male hawk, and there's huge discrepancy, primarily because, um, because whenever you're talking about a male hawk, you see different, you see a different side. You see, like for instance, Carl. You see that Anders romance Carl, and the, like the whole aspect of love in the circle, and like the kind of like hidden thing that you see in Asunder whenever um, people fall in love and they like mean in secret, and they try to stay to get with each other, but the Templars are kind of like backing them off and in two corners and they're just restricting them from everything and for me i was just like well look like you just made male hawk more significant than female hawk like to, for uh, in my opinion i think that that is a different thing like y you need to be able to and i think the devs mentioned this i'm pretty sure um that whenever you have a romance you want to make sure that it feels complete that 
it, it feels completely right and whole. And for me, that you whenever whenever because I'm one of those players that played both sides, and it's just like there's a huge discrepancy, there's a huge difference that adds a layer of depth in the male Hulk and Anders one that I'm just like. You kind of ruined female Hulk for me, <laughs> as far as the romances go. And just, like, you see it in a different light. You see the twisted kind of, like, values that Anders has. Because he not only lived in the circle, but, and he's trying to save not only his friends, but he's trying to save someone that he loved. And it's just, like, I, I don't care if it was, like, you know, they had a tussle and they weren't really, like, you know in love with each other and you just like have a physical relationship or whatever. But it's someone that you're attached to and you're willing to save. And for me, I feel like bisexuality, like in games, it's, it's a convenience that I think that it's really cool that you have it and it makes it more convenient for the player who doesn't want to do a completely different run, but it doesn't feel realistic enough. I know <laughs> realism in video games, what are you talking about? But it doesn't feel real to have a romance, um, to have both sides live it in the way that it does. Like, the only way that I can see it is that if you make it identical. Like, you you literally have it identical on both sides. The personalities don't change. Depth is still the same. And, like, the the passion stays the same. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I have a really bad time talking about passion and not laughing because I think of uh, way too many things that Tumblr has uh, shown me about uh, passion in Dragon Age. <sighs> Excuse me. <laughs> But that's my general gist of everything, like, thinking about it. Um, okay. Uh, I, I'm no, I don't know how to switch that. I guess we could switch into, because we're talking about Anders and, like, the whole capacity of how he loved Carl and, or loved Carl. He was with Carl. Let's just put it that way. Um, I wanted to also talk about the Chantry and the Mages, because I really want this to, uh, to surface in Inquisition, and I want it to be talked about, um, primarily because, okay, uh, if you read Asunder, you'll find out more about Wynn and her background and all of that, and you get to find out about, um, Rise's father, and, uh, yeah, that whole thing, but, <laughs> but, like, more specifically, I wanted to talk more about how Wynn addresses the Chantry, and, um, before, obviously, her kind of, um, breakdown during the, the battle, um, how she views the Chantry as a thing that can actually happen, that it can actually stay and be fine, that it can live for mages and not be a huge problem. Um, it took me a while to think about it, but to be honest, I kind of agree with her, but in the sense that it's a limited kind of thing. The interaction with the circle, not living there forever, but living there until you grow as a person and you learn the different dangers and different things about magic to the point that you you don't want to do it <laughs> or you know how to use it well and you don't use it for power you don't use it for the sake of challenging others and whatnot you don't turn into a Tevinter kind of like magister to the point that you use it and you engage magic in very safe uh, I shouldn't even say that because sometimes it's more situational but to the point that it doesn't become a danger that you you are aware of all the dangers and you can leave whenever you're 18 or 21 or anything of the sort and this also came to the point um in my head whenever i was thinking about thrask and the mages and templars working with each other and they were completely fine until obviously i can't remember her name um uh, the crazy mage that decided to kill Thrask and, like, uh, raise havoc and all that. With the one that Elaine was following. Um, the, the young mage. Um, and it's just like, I want it to happen. I know the circle is dead, essentially. I mean, obviously the mages are still there and all that. Um, and the Navarin Accord with all the, the Seekers and the Templars separating from the Chantry. But... I just wanted to have him because I think the Chantry actually could be a thing. And it's just like, it blew up to the point where it wasn't even allowed to happen. And I want to see, like, the, for instance, like, there were the Libertarians and there were different, what is it, Equestrians? And there were different, not Equestrians, <laughs> um, there were different, like, groups of mages that, you know, believe in different aspects that you go into detail whenever you're reading Asunder. And it's just like, 
I want that to happen. I want that to be talked about. It if you did the actual mage um origin uh story in Dragon Age Origins, um you get to learn about them and you get to, you know, talk briefly about them with the dudes whenever you're playing that specific origin story. But if you're not a circle mage, obviously you don't get that depth. You don't get the aspect of it. And only if you actually play through it do you actually get to appreciate the different kind of people that live within the circle. And the chaos and all of those crazy people. <laughs> but I really hope it's brought up in Inquisition, to be honest. Because I think... And I think it will happen, but the only thing is I don't want it to detract from the story between mages and Templars. I don't know how to happen. I don't know if, if rejuvenating the circle will happen. It might, it might not, and they might jail them all or whatever. Because I know the Inquisition and the Inquisitor has the ability to affect the Mage and Templar conflict, the way that I talked about it in resounding steps. But uh, I hope for it to be addressed. Okay, totally going off topic. Um, I mentioned about decisions and what is it? Specifically on my bullet points, it says decision, decisions I want to seriously have purpose and significance in the next game, like Dragon Cults. Um, yeah, Dragon Cults. Um, more specifically, whenever you're doing the uh, the Ashes of Andraste quest and you have the option of either uh, defiling the ashes and, or you can just say, oh, F it, I'm just going to drink some dragon blood or whatnot. Um, now, for me, um, I have a lot of different choices that I want to go into Inquisition. And to be honest, I do want to know yours, so please put in comment section so I can see. Because I know I'm only a one person and I'm doing a monologue and I have my own pre-designated thoughts that I want to happen. But let me know yours. And actually, now I think about it, no, tell, let me know yours so I can put it in a future video. I think it'd be better. I can put it in a future video and we can talk about it. And eventually, I do want to have a Google Hangout, like I think I mentioned. Oh, Ashley, you're so good at this and memory and sh shoop. Um, but as far as decisions go, like, for instance, um, you get to see one of the decisions, like Artificer Dagna, who shows up in the demo whenever you're talking about agents or whenever you're looking at it on agents. And I helped her. I, I completely let her go to the circle um, in Origins. And it's just, like, all these different options that, like, as far as... Um, the ones that we don't see surface into the games, right? Like, uh, like from one game to the other. Like Liliana, she can die. She can die completely in the in the first game, and she comes back and she's like, "No, I, I'm okay." Um, personally, I have a specific uh, <laughs> reason in my head why she's still alive, and a lot of people are like, um. Oh no, she, it, it's a complete retcon. And to be honest, for me, I think there's a completely logical reason why she's alive and people don't realize that whenever I'm kind of like hinting at it and like poking like come on think about it Anders when Evangeline come on but uh, <laughs> but um there are a lot of different de decisions that I really hope that proceed into Inquisition and my only big problem is uh, like okay not problem but like in Dragon Age Keep um it's already been reported that uh there, there's going to be dozens of choices, not just like, you know, like a, a few specific ones. Like if we were doing the Mass Effect comic and you just choose, oh, hey, did you choose Ashley or Caden? But like a lot of different, like huge, obviously huge, like who did you side with? The mages or the elves, or mages or the elves, the mages or the Templars. But also you get to see like the small ones, like, oh, did you send Dagna over? Like, is there going to be Exalted March? Is there going to be a whole bunch of other different things? Um, speaking of that exalted march, <laughs> nah, just kidding. <laughs> um, like I have a different, I, I have a lot of different uh, decisions. So I, please, please let me know in the comment section down below. Write it up, type it up, and enter. <laughs> but I'm gonna switch topics because this is gonna be the last one, and this is more about something that someone on Tumblr asked me. And if you want to ask anything, you can just do on ladyinsanity.com slash ask. Did I say that right? Yes, I did. Um, I'm just going to read the comment. So, so tight, so tough, wrote, do you like how in Dragon Age, making decisions seems to he rely heavily on companion approval rather than in Mass Effect with a moral compass? I like the idea that I can be a good person 
and make good decisions and still keep all my friends. I like in Mass Effect, if a companion disagrees with you and interjects, if you have good, enough good points, you can persuade them to agree with you and you still have them as a friend. But that's not in the case that's not the case in Dragon Age, especially DA2. Um Actually, um Origins had brought up the companion persuasion pretty well, I think. Like for instance, whenever you uh you can make the negative points hurt less if you have uh if you convince your companions um something's a good idea. Like uh like Alistair, for instance, whenever you bring him to Redcliffe Village, or not Redcliffe Village, Redcliffe Ca uh, Castle, and you go to the dungeons, and you meet Joan, who is a mage, and obviously if you play the Circle Mage origin story, you'll be able to know, like, oh, that's the dude that <laughs> basically betrayed you, and he turned into a blood mage, and all that jazz. Um, but you can, you can persuade Alistair to think that it's a good idea, and instead of, like, negative 15, it turns into, like, negative 3. Um, points. <laughs> so, like, uh, I, I personally prefer the companion responses rather than the moral compass kind of thing. Um, for me, it, it, it gives me incentive. It gives me, like, this emotional impact, like, kind of like, oh, I'm telling my, I'm telling my companion, look, this is going to be a good idea, I swear to God. Or you can say, you know, we're just going to completely ignore it. Because, like, the way that I phrased it, the reason why I played Dragon Age the reason I play a Mass Effect and, like, different choice-driven games is that I make up fracked-up decisions that have huge presence in the world. And that's the only way... I, that's the only reason why I choose these games. I mean, gameplay is great and all, and, you know, oh, hey, Flaming Sword, but <laughs> that's what really drives me. I'm a narrative-driven kind of player. That's how it works out. I want to be able to challenge my person, to challenge my companion, and... If they don't agree with me, they're welcome to just either sit back at the camp or they can just say, screw it, I'm leaving, see ya. And I like that idea because I can just be like, look, I'm going to stand up for what I have, my morals and my logic and how I see the world and how it should be seen. Um, and that's what I want to be able to do. I mean, in Mass Effect, they have this whole atmosphere of, oh, it's Commander Shepard. Like, you can't deny Commander Shepard, except for... Kate and Ashley, and that's a totally different situation because you can, you know, you can shoot them if you don't give them a bottle of whiskey or buy them a book. I'm not even going to talk about that. But, <laughs> but, like, for me, it's just like, it felt too much, you do what as I say. Like, your command, your companions will never, ever leave, and I hated that because, oh, okay, like, uh, except for Kate and Ashley, and technically Tally. But Tally kills herself, so that's a totally different thing. Spoiler alert! Um, like, I want to be able to have that option where my companions hate me to the point that they refuse my decision making and they leave. I want that to be a thing because that gives me the opportunity to really feel for a game. To feel a part of the world. And obviously apart from that companion or that kind of character. And I want to be able to have that. I mean, it worked in Mass Effect where they, you know, your companions are going to go with whatever you want, even if they hate you, even if they learn to hate you or whatnot. Um, but, like, for instance, in DA2, like, uh, like the original OP mentioned, like, uh, <laughs> the original OP, like the OP mentioned, uh, original poster, there we go, um, the whole aspect of that, like, it's, it's Hawk, he's, he or she is not a character of power. They're just the champion of Kirkwall, and they don't have that kind of precedence of, like, a Viscount or anything like that where people are going to follow them. Inquisitors will. And I feel like the, Inqui in the Inquisitor himself or herself is going to be in put into many different situations where the companion should be like, look, you know, you may be a really cool guy and you might have a powerful army of soldiers, but I don't need to be here. I think that's where it's going to end up in Inquisition. It's going to be, it's still going to hold the premise of it's a loosey-goosey organization and until it gets to the end, whenever you're an extreme power, whenever you're about to battle whoever tore the veil asunder, um, up until that point, it's going to be your companions are flimsy and not everyone's going to stay with you. And that's totally fine with me. So, in any case, those were my pre-inquisition thoughts i'm sure i'm going to have a whole bunch of these before the end of um before the end of this long 
This long wait period before fall 2014, whenever Inquisition decides to come out. But those were my thoughts, and I would really like to know yours. So let me know in the comment section below what you think. More specifically on what decisions do you want to surface in Inquisition. I mentioned my whole thing on the mages and the chantry. Also about like the matter of the companions. Um, I want to be able to, you know, have them leave. And I think it would be really cool if you could find out how does it affect, um, like, for instance, if I had Anders completely leave before, um, before the end, or if I had a specific care, if I never picked up Fenris, let's put it that way. <laughs> the gorgeous elf, if I never picked him up or anything like that. Um, betting is about, uh, not Isabella, Liliana. Why not? So let me know. I'm going to end this here. It was nice talking to you all. I hope it doesn't turn into a monologue. And I, w I, have, I would love to have this into a dialogue and eventually have a Google Hangout or a Skype chat or anything like that where I can just talk with people. So <laughs> that sounded so sad. I have no friends. Talk to me. Okay. No, but anyway. Uh, oh, speaking of... No, I'll mention it later. In any case, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Even though I didn't exactly, I don't think I'm going to have like a overlay or something like that of, on this. But thank you for being here. And I shall talk to you all in the comment section. Okay.